You've heard the term, keeping up with the Joneses. Usually this implies mowing your lawn on the same day as the house next door, or painting your front door when the neighbor does it. But no case was ever more extreme than that of Cornelius Vanderbilt II. Hi everyone, Ken here. Welcome to this house. Today we are exploring Cornelius Vanderbilt II's mansion, and more deeply how a large ego coupled with immense wealth led to the construction of the largest home to ever be built in New York City. Make sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an exciting episode of this house. Sitting at the northwest corner of 5th Avenue and West 57th Street in Manhattan was once the largest home to ever grace Central Park. It was built in 1883 for Cornelius Vanderbilt II, one of the heirs to the Vanderbilt fortune. The first floor boasted an elaborate drawing room, a heavily ornamented dining room that was said to double as an art gallery, and a reception room for welcoming guests. Going upstairs, you would have encountered a grand salon paired with a music room and a conservatory. We can imagine the world's most elite socialites filling these grand halls for banquets and other gatherings. Going up further in the house, most of the rest of the rooms would have been devoted to sleeping quarters for both the family and their servants. All of this luxurious space would prove not to be enough for Cornelius. As the neighborhood began to fill in around him, he started to feel insecure with the size of his mansion, wanting not to be outdone. He purchased all of the properties on his 5th Avenue block and had them demolished to pave way for a much larger home that would consume the entirety of the block. He hired Richard Morris Hunt and George B. Post to construct the most obscene mansion New York had ever seen. He brought in the world-renowned designers, Jules Allard and Sons from France, to design the intricacies of the interior spaces. With other neighbors bringing entire rooms from Europe, Cornelius felt compelled to keep up by having many pieces of the house shipped in from across the pond. The mansion would soar at six stories tall and include a private manicured garden with stables adjacent to the property. Walking in the front door of the mansion would have left you breathless as you looked up towards the ceiling to see the five-story stone walls disappearing behind the flickering light. At the end of this grand entrance hall was an ornate library, a petite salon, a grand salon, a two-story ballroom, a watercolor room, and, in paying homage to the original house, a two-story dining room that once again doubled as an art gallery full of the most expensive art that Cornelius could acquire. The house meandered on throughout the first floor. You would have also stumbled upon a two-story smoking room inspired by Moorish design, a private den and office, as well as a pantry that was said to have been stocked with enough food to feed a village. Traveling up the grand staircase to the second floor would bring you to Mrs. Alice Vanderbilt's lavish sleeping quarters, complete with a full bathroom, a walk-in closet, dressing room, boudoir, and a private study. Having the largest home in New York was still not enough for Cornelius, as the elite in his circles began to purchase summer homes. He sought to outdo all of them by purchasing the Breakers in Newport, Rhode Island, a 125,000 square foot mansion that he referred to as his humble summer cottage. While staying at his vacation home, he tragically suffered a stroke which would leave him confined to a wheelchair. Three years later, he passed away and willed Alice a $7 million trust fund, the mansion on 57th Street and the Summer Cottage. Alice, devastated by the loss of her husband, never remarried nor did she invite any guests to the mansion ever again, aside from the funerals of her two sons. Alice lived out many more years in the mansion with only the company of her 37 private servants to tend to her every need. By 1926, the commercialization of the neighborhood was in full swing, with skyscrapers replacing many of the mansions that once existed. Alice was running low on money, having a budget of only $250,000 per year to live on, or the modern day equivalent of over $4 million per year. She sold the house to Braisted Realty Corporation for $7 million, or the modern day equivalent of $114 million. Alice, now faced with losing the home she loved, decided to open it to the public one week before its scheduled demolition. She charged 50 cents per person for admittance and donated all the money she raised with tours to charity. She frantically tried to save every part of the house that she loved, donating fireplaces and other architectural elements to anyone who would take them. Even the gate that once protected the front doors of the mansion would be donated to be used at the 105 Street entrance of Central Park, which can still be seen open and welcoming in people from all around the world. Thank you all for watching. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Let me know what you thought of Cornelius's mansions down below in the comments. If you haven't yet, make sure to check out our merch shop to get yourself a This House logo branded coffee mug. I'd also like to take a moment to say thank you to our This House supporters whose names you can see on screen right now. If you would like to see your name on the screen, please join our membership program today. I'll see you next time on This House.